Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to worship here at Emmanuel Baptist Church. No, I'm not really at the church, but we are the church gathered together today. And we are glad that you're here. I have some announcements. Um, some have been posted already in the chat space. I'm going to share those out loud for the benefit of people who learn better by hearing and also for people who are on the phones. Marilyn is sharing that the Lifelong Faith Formation team is hosting a Zoom meeting on Tuesday, this Tuesday from four to five o'clock. We will be trans, uh, I'm sorry, we will be brainstorming ideas for doing faith formation during this time of social distancing. Anyone with interest is invited to join. You can contact Marilyn or me for the link. Another announcement is that camping at Pathfinder will not happen on site this summer, but there will be a virtual camping program. Details coming tomorrow, you can check the Pathfinder website. Um, let's see, we also, another announcement, this one not so much from Marilyn, is that there will be virtual coffee hour today for people who want to stick around. Uh, we try to do that for 20 or 25 minutes and we're going to set up two rooms, uh, one for general conversation and one to offer um, comments, feedback, talk back about the sermon. If you want to be part of one of those groups, send a message to Jim Wilkerson in the chat or um, I've given his, his phone number there so you can text him uh, to indicate which group you wanna be part of. And from Ruth and Ellen, I'm sorry, this one's really from Ruth. You should have received an EBC announce email a few days ago with a note that we are changing platforms for the listserv. What that means is that EBC announce, the, the way that we can send emails to each other in one group is still going to be a thing, but it's moving to a different website. And so people need to subscribe to that new thing. And if you didn't, if you got an email, then you know how to do that. It, it told you how. If you didn't get an email and you want to be part of that, and we would love for you to, then contact Ruth or Curtis and um, they will get that information to you. There, um, are there any other announcements that people want to make? You can unmute yourself if you have an announcement. Okay, I don't see any. In just a minute, we are going to uh, begin worship with our children's time. So if you have children in your household, who are not where they can see the screen, I would um, encourage you to invite them to be there now. And Marilyn, I'm going to ask you, you said you had an announcement to make. Yes, um, I said to, the children received a letter this week with, with a craft in it, and I gave you four clues as to what the story is that we're doing, we're going to be doing this summer. And I told, promised I would give a fifth clue today. So because the adults listen to this also, we'll see if they can figure it out. I didn't get anybody texting me with the right answer yet. So this is about the story that we're going to do this summer. It has a king and a queen, actually two queens. One of the queens is a Jewish orphan. There are spies and evil plots. Someone in the story is very brave. And the, today's hint is there is a book of the Bible named for the main character. So I see some heads nodding that they've figured it out. We'll see if any of the children have. The story will start next week and you'll be getting some props in the mail this week. Um, so I, I hope we're gonna have fun with this. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Marilyn. So without any more delay, we have 
a word from Naughty Raccoon. What does that say, Grandma? Oh, it says, America for Christ offering. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's an offering we give to give back to those who need our help. Naughty Raccoon had an idea. He would make a clay pot, then he would decorate it, and then he would plant something in it to sell. He would make a great deal of money for this offering. So he made the pot. He decorated it with rubber bands. It was quite nice. Then he put stickers on it. It was even better. Then he dropped it. Grandma saw this and she said, don't worry. Jesus said, the clay pot is only what holds something precious inside. We carry this precious message around in the unadorned clay pots of our ordinary lives. Jesus said, light up the darkness, and our lives filled up with the light. As we saw and understood in the face of Christ, all bright and beautiful. We are wonderful pots, broken in places, but the pot holds the greatness of the work of God. He thought he understood, so he fixed the pot, and he planted something, and there was the wonder of God. Okay, so the sign said, you know what to do, adults. You know what that is? Write the check, go to the website. Just remember, we've been as close to a depression as, as ever in the last three months. And people in this country and across the world are really suffering the effects of poverty. So America for Christ this year is really a critical offering. And also remember that 25% uh, comes right back to the region. So this is a wonderful offering. Just please give. Thank you. Thank you, Tony and Naughty Raccoon. Becca Leet is our worship leader today. She is going to read the voice of one on the call to worship, which will appear on your screen. I'm going to read the voice of many and invite you to read um, along with me in your own spaces. Come and give thanks to our God. Sing praises to God's holy name with the melody of the lute and the harp and the song in our hearts. We announce God's steadfast love at daybreak and sing God's faithful presence all through the night. 
The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. God is great and greatly to be praised. O Lord, we sing for joy at the work of your hands. Our first hymn is Morning Has Broken. Join me in prayer. Holy One, you are the boundless shaper of people and nations. You are beyond our knowing, yet closer to us than our every breath. You are before us and behind us, surrounding us with your love and fashioning all of creation in the depths of your own heart. With every thought, with every song, with every prayer, turn these fragile earthen vessels of our lives into the spirit-filled body of Christ. For we pray in Jesus' name, and as he taught us, we say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first reading is from 2 Corinthians, and Becca's going to read that for us. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who had said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but the, uh, life is at work in you. Thanks, Becca. 
we have um, an offertory anthem from our choir. Our second reading is from the book of Jeremiah, and it has a video. It will be read on video. The Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. He said, go down to the shop where clay pots and jars are made. I will speak to you while you are there. So I did as he told me and found the potter working at his wheel. But the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped. So the potter squashed the jar into a lump of clay and he started again. Then the Lord gave me this message, O Israel, can I not do to you as this potter has done to his clay? As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. If I announce that a certain nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down and destroyed, but then that nation renounces its evil ways, I will not destroy it as I have planned. And if I announce that I will build up and plant a certain nation or kingdom, making it strong and great, but then that nation turns to evil and refuses to obey me, I will not bless that nation as I had said I would. The choir has a choral response to that uh, text we just heard. Change 
We come to our prayer time. I would invite you to share uh, prayer concerns. Perhaps even today we might have some things uh, to share that are celebrations. And I would invite you to share those. Let us pray together. Gracious and loving God, we come to you with hearts that need to be open to your word, to your deep peace, to your love that casts out fear. There is so much around us that tears at us and causes us anxiety. Keep us ever mindful of your presence and the hope that we have in Jesus the Christ. We are grateful for those who bear witness to you in all kinds of ways. We are grateful for those who will be supported, whose work will be supported, and whose lives will be made better through the America for Christ offering. We are grateful for those among us celebrating holidays, including Ken Cole, as we celebrate him on the day after his birthday. God, guide us in this time. Keep us focused on the mission and ministry to which you have called us. We know that there is much we do not know right now. Save us from dwelling on that. Help us to feel secure in your love. Hear our prayers, O oh God, for all who need your tender touch of healing in their lives. For those that we have named before you. For those recovering from illness. For Becky at home. For Ken, and for those who are known only to you in the depths of our hearts. Be with those who mourn. We pray with Judah that the poor will not always be so. Receive these, our prayers, together with those that lie on the hearts of all your faithful people. We offer them in the name of Jesus, who said, not my will, but thine be done. Amen.
<clears throat> On a Sunday a few years ago, I gave you clay. I gave everyone in the sanctuary some clay to play with, to form into any shape you wanted. I gave a few more instructions than that, but it was pretty much an open exercise. I was not asking you to create a certain final product. Most of you went along with it at the time because you're great sports. But as soon as worship was over, you dropped your clay, whatever you had created with it, into the trash. I know because I went around and rescued all the clay from the garbage cans. Of all my attempts at creating engaging worship elements, this was one of the most stunning failures. I wonder what happened. Some of you said, you just don't like to work with your hands like that. Some of you said, you don't think that you are artistic enough to do that. I wonder if, in fact, some of us are fairly creative. Actually, I know that most of you are pretty creative, but I wonder if clay is just not a medium that we know how to work with. I wonder if any of us found the clay resistant, if it was hard to knead it and make it soft and pliable enough to work with, so we got frustrated. Jeremiah compares God to a potter working with clay. And I wonder if God ever felt like that, like we did. The first time God is described as a potter in the Bible, it's at the beginning. In Genesis 2, God kneels on the ground, grabs a piece of moistened clay, and fashions from it a human being. The Hebrew word translated as potter in Jeremiah 18 is the same word as that used in Genesis 2. And not long after that beginning in Genesis 2, human beings start to assert their own ideas, their own will, which is not always in keeping with God's plans. So by the time that Jeremiah makes his way into that potter's shop, God has been dealing with disobedient humans for a very long time. And Jeremiah has too. Jeremiah has been calling the people to repentance for their false worship and social injustice. And they have not listened. In fact, a few verses after our reading, the leaders of Judah plot to kill Jeremiah. They don't like his message at all and they wanna shut him up permanently. So Jeremiah goes on God's instruction to the potter's shop and the message that he hears there is harsh. It sounds like God is saying, I am the potter who made you and I can destroy you. I brought you into this world and I can take you out. It is strong language. And we should note that the prophecies of Jeremiah, which is a very long book, are full of strong language. He repeatedly warns the people of impending doom and they pay no attention to him. His language gets more and more harsh in an attempt to get their attention. It's also important to hear all of what he says. The Lord is sovereign over Judah, over all of creation, but also hoping not to exercise that sovereignty. Four times in these verses that we heard, God uses the word if. If the people will do X, then God will do Y. If the people will change their behavior, then God will change God's plans. The creator is responsive to the creature. There is give and take in this relationship. Now, if this was the only example of divine and human interaction in the Bible, then we might conclude that God is some kind of angry tyrant, a puppet master who compels people to do what God wants. But what we actually have in scripture are stories of unexpected grace, of people receiving what they needed 
instead of what they thought they deserved. What we see in scripture are the times when God's change of mind was a decision not to punish. We might remember the time when the people were in the wilderness and Moses was gone for a long time and they got anxious and they built a golden calf to worship. God was going to destroy them. But Moses pleaded with God and God relented. Or we might remember when Jonah was sent to Nineveh with a message of coming destruction from God. Only the people took the message to heart and changed their ways and God changed the plan. I read up a little bit on potters this week. I learned that they never waste clay. If something falls apart on the wheel, the clay goes into a bin called reclaim, which is all the scraps and pieces that have failed somewhere in production. They're all kept together to be mixed back into usable clay. Another potter said that clay may be passive, but it has its own life its nature can resist the potter. So the potter strives to open it up. Keeping it centered on the wheel is important to shape and reshape it. The outside of the vessel must conform to the inside. And sometimes the clay gets exhausted, she said, and must be set aside for a while. The relationship between potter and clay seems an apt metaphor for the relationship between God and humans. And if we can think like a potter, then we might recognize God not as bent on human destruction, but like a potter who is eager to coax something beautiful from resistant clay. Now, from the point of view of the clay, it might feel either like punishment or like growth. And it seems significant that the metaphor holds as long as the clay continues to be malleable. In the next chapter of Jeremiah, the image is of clay that has been fired into a jug and it shatters when it's dropped. One scholar suggests this is what happens when we harden, when our shape, our ideas, our faith become fixed and brittle, we leave little room for God's grace to reshape us. Jeremiah was speaking to difficult people, his own people. He was speaking in love. Some 500 years later, Paul was also dealing with difficult people. The first church in Corinth was resisting his leadership. Paul had made mistakes. He wasn't as flashy as, or as articulate as those who challenged his authority. He was probably a little frustrated with these Corinthians. And he knew his Bible. I have to wonder if this passage from Jeremiah was in his mind when he mentioned clay jars. Maybe he wanted the Corinthians to remember that God could take them off the wheel and throw them in the reclaim bin. But doesn't quite go there. Instead, he recognizes his own weakness. He recognizes his own suffering and the suffering of the Corinthians. They are all afflicted perplexed, persecuted, and struck down, he says. We humans are fragile and easily broken. In Paul's analogy, we are more like inexpensive pottery that shatters than like malleable clay. But Paul says we have this treasure in clay jars. We have this treasure that is the good news of Jesus, we have the extraordinary power of forgiveness and generosity and hospitality and justice through Jesus who dwells within us. And so Paul says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, 
but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. We suffer as human beings, sometimes for the sake of the gospel, sometimes simply because that's the nature of life. But God's strength is often demonstrated in our weakness. Archaeologists have recovered clay jars like this one from the first century. Perhaps this is what Paul had in mind ordinary, functional, not very valuable containers. They were considered fragile and disposable. But we might note that jars like this held the Dead Sea Scrolls, preserving that treasure for thousands of years, which kind of makes Paul's point for him. We have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. A few years ago, some of us had the privilege of being on a retreat with Libby Little. Those of you joining us from beyond Albany may not know about Libby and her husband, Tom. They were from upstate New York, but they spent 30 years living and working in Afghanistan, where they raised their three daughters. They stayed through the Soviet occupation. They hid in their basement, but continued to work during the Taliban rule of the 1990s, all because they wanted to provide eye care for the Afghan people. Tom was an optometrist. In 2010, in fact, my very first week in Albany, Tom was returning from a mission to an outlying area with nine other people when they were attacked and killed by the Taliban. On that retreat a few years ago, Libby talked about her life in Afghanistan. She talked about the loss of her husband and other hardships they had endured, but she didn't dwell on that. What I remember about her presentation, what was most vivid were her teapots. In Afghanistan, there is a highly skilled process of repairing broken pottery. Glue and metal staples are used to make the containers watertight again and her repaired teapots were fascinating. There's a similar artistry in Japanese culture. They use gold in the glue to mend the cracks in an object. They recognize that imperfection is credibility and scars are signs of improvement. So they highlight repairs and make them beautiful. When the Russians left, Afghanistan slipped into a protracted civil war. Speaking about that time, Libby said 100 rockets a day was a good day. We kept thinking that it was going to get better, but it was a terrible time. It was a time when really the ground was leveled. We felt that we were able to come alongside the Afghan people and their suffering. Until then, we really had no idea what suffering was. And after Tom's death, she said, we may never know what happened. We hold no hate in our hearts for the Afghan people. We're not out for revenge or retaliation at all. We pray for whoever did this and keep working towards forgiveness. Sometimes it is simple obedience. Sometimes it is fortitude in the midst of unjust suffering. Often it's a combination, but the tie that binds is our formation, 
our responsiveness to the potter God who shapes and reshapes us and forgives our sin and is made strong in our weakness. We have this treasure in clay jars, Paul says, so that the life of Jesus may be visible, so that the extraordinary power of God may shine from our hearts. May it be so for you and for me. Amen. Our closing hymn harkens back to that part of the reading which says that God has caused um, Christ's light to shine. And so we will sing together, Christ be our light. So it appears we have some folks uh, who do want to stay for coffee hour. So we will be doing that um, about five minutes after the benediction. As always, thank you for your presence and participation. And now would you receive a benediction? May the Lord Christ go before you to prepare your way. Christ beside you be companion to you everywhere you go. 
Christ beneath you to strengthen and sustain you when you fall or fail. Christ behind you to finish and complete what you must leave undone. Christ within you to give you courage and hope, faith and love. But mostly Christ above bless and keep you now and evermore. <laughs>